Arracha Aldeón de Tenorín, muchas gracias por venir a compartir con nosotros este encuentro literario con John Maxwell Coeche. Conversará con Soledad Constantini de la editorial Hilo de Ariadna, que junto con Penguin Random House ha publicado el último libro de Coeche, titulado Siete cuentos morales. Premio Nobel en 2003 se une a la lista de premios Nobel que han pasado por Azcuna Centro A y también por el programa Gutun Suria. Nos referimos a Gerta Miller, Oran Pamuk y Gao Xinjiang. Solo dos detalles para presentar siete cuentos morales. Por un lado, recupera al personaje de Elizabeth Costello y también eh, recordar que es el eh, que se publica antes en lengua castellana que en cualquier otro idioma. Les queremos recordar que, aunque no habrá turno de preguntas, sí que tras la conversación habrá firma de libros en el lugar habitual, es decir, en el hall de la sala de exposiciones. Muchas gracias. Good evening. Thank you all for coming tonight. John, I hope that in our conversation we will be able to touch on a variety of subjects. I think we should concentrate on your latest book, Seven Moral Tales, that has recently been published. But we, before we do that, maybe we can talk about um, your activities in Latin America and then later about some of the influences and some of the themes of your writing. And maybe at a certain point you could read from one of the stories from your latest book. How does that sound? It sounds good. Uh, before I begin, uh, I'd like to thank the alcalde of Bilbao, Juan Marie Aburto, and also the Ascuna Centroa, represented by Alaisne Martin and Fernando Perez, for inviting me to this festival and to your beautiful city. I'd also like to thank uh, Random House, my publisher, represented by Claudio Lopez La Madrid, for bringing me to Spain uh, this year. Shall we proceed? Okay. Over the last few years, you have frequently visited some of the countries of Latin America, Mexico, Brazil, Uruguay, Chile, Argentina. There is a prize in Chile under your name that you give every year. And in Argentina, the UNSAM, the University of San Martin, has created a cathedra, J.M. Cuzia, um, about literatures of the South. Would you care to comment about this program in Argentina? Yes. Uh, as you say, uh, since, since the year 2015, I've uh, occupied a personal cathedra at the Universidad de San Martín in Buenos Aires where I have dedicated my energies to bringing together writers from uh, three continents that are far apart in geography and in language, but that seem to me to have affiliations in their history and in their relation to the land. And I refer, on the one hand, to the vast literature of Latin America, more specifically, the literature of Argentina, and to the less vast but still considerable literatures of Southern Africa and Australia. As part of my duties, I have uh, brought writers from Southern Africa and Australia to Argentina to offer courses in their respective literatures. And these courses have been attended not only by students from Buenos Aires, but from students elsewhere in Argentina and from uh, Latin America more widely. 
what have been the uh, fruits of their visits? Some of the fruits, I think, are intangible, some more tangible. Let me um, just list a f some of the more tangible uh, results. First of all, a number of works of fiction by Australian, by South African, and by Mozambican writers have been published in Argentina by the press of Universidad San Martín. And in the reverse direction, uh, an Australian publishing house has initiated a series of translations of Argentine writers. Um, also, through the kindness of the Australian taxpayer, we've been able to bring several Argentine writers to Australia on extended residencies. My overriding concern as professor at uh, UNSAM has been that students of the three literatures I've mentioned should be able to meet and interact with writers from elsewhere in the South without northern mediation, by which I mean without having to pass the cultural gatekeepers of the metropolis of the North, the people who decide which books from Latin America will be translated into English and which books will not, who decide which figures from the South will be promoted worldwide and which will not, and most importantly, who decide which stories by the South about itself will be accepted into the repertoire of world literature and which will not. Um, you will have noticed that in speaking of literatures of the South, I have not used the term the global South. And there is a reason for this. And to my way of thinking, the South is a real part of the world, a part of the world with a climate and flora and fauna of its own, indeed with more than just natural features in common, with strong commonalities of history and culture. The commonalities of history include long and complex histories of colonization. The so-called Global South, on the other hand, is a concept merely, an abstraction invented by social scientists. It is the negative other of the North, the site of absences, absence of wealth, absence of in infrastructure, absence of communications. By emphasizing the real, tangible, commonalities of the lands of the South, by bringing their poets and thinkers a little closer together. I'm therefore doing my best to counteract the cultural hegemony of the North. Your latest book, Seven Moral Tales, has been published first in Spanish. Is there a meaningful gesture on your part, or am I reading too much into the story? No, you're not reading too much into the story. Publishing first in Spanish, and in particular publishing first in Argentina, is indeed a gesture on my part and an intended gesture. Whether it is a meaningful gesture, I'm not yet in a position to say. Um, let me try to place this the new book in context. As I look back over my career, which now extends over five decades, uh, this is what I see. I see a young man born in South Africa of an ethnicity which is hard to define. At, as a first approximation, he seems to be an Afrikaner, but there are several key features of Afrikaner identity that he possesses only weakly. 
He starts writing works of fiction in an acquired language, English. He finds a small publisher in South Africa. He sells a few thousand copies of his books. He wins some local prizes, but his ambitions are larger. His ambition is to be published in what he thinks of as the real world, which is, to him, London, but even more, New York. At the age of 40, he makes a breakthrough with a book called Waiting for the Barbarians, which becomes a minor bestseller in the United States. Thereafter, his books are published concurrently in London and New York as they come out and are then translated into foreign languages, that is, languages other than English. He has become what is known in the book trade as an international author, a term which does not have a precise meaning, but one thing is certain about it. You cannot be an international author if you are born and lived and live in the United States or Britain. As he grows older, this man I'm talking about, who had once upon a time studied and worked in the United States, finds himself becoming more and more alienated from the United States, particularly the United States of George Bush the Younger. He dislikes the complacent belief of North Americans that their way of life and their culture are destined to take over the globe. As for England, where he has also lived and worked, there is no country where he feels more out of place than there. He loses interest in the way his books are read and received in the English-speaking world. He becomes more interested in the way they are received elsewhere. He we works closely with his translators, and he begins to think of himself as an international author in a different sense, a writer who is not located in any particular language or any particular country. It is no longer clear to him why his books should come out first in English and then later in other languages. And he tries the experiment of publishing his books in Dutch translation before they come out in English. He then finds a sympathetic publisher in Argentina, El Gino de Ariadna. He entertains the idea of publishing in the South, in Spanish, in Latin America, in English, in Australia, and letting the North wait if it is still interested in reading him. And so, finally, we have the Siete Cuentos. We also have, I should finally mention, uh, two novels entitled The Childhood of Jesus and The School Days of Jesus, in which people arrive in the next life and find that the language spoken in the next life is not English, but Spanish. Mm. Okay. Elizabeth Costello, <coughs> who figures in a number of the stories in Seven Moral Tales, has appeared in several earlier books of yours. Between 1999, when she first appeared, and the present, has she evolved as a character? Uh, some years ago, a friend of mine from Australia, a writer, uh, went on a lecture tour of India, lecturing on contemporary Australian literature. And uh, after one of his lectures, someone in the audience put up his hand and said, uh, Sir, can you tell us something about this Australian writer named Elizabeth Costello? And I mention this story because it shows how a fictional being, Elizabeth Costello, can take up residence in the real world. 
and also how a fictional creation can escape the control of her creator. Um, you ask about the evolution of Elizabeth Costello. As you mentioned, she first appeared in the world in 1999, when I was invited to give two lectures at a university in the United States, and my lectures concerned a writer, Elizabeth Costello, who is invited to give two lectures at a university in the United States. Um, in the years that followed, I wrote several more pieces in which Elizabeth Costello figured, and her biography began to expand. She acquires an older sister, who is a nun. She takes up residence in a village in Spain, where she leads a more and more isolated existence. Her son and her daughter grow worried about her. They try to persuade her to leave her isolated home and move to a city where there are better medical facilities, and she resists all their efforts. Now, these stories uh, appeared to me, so to speak, and Elizabeth's life grew of its own accord, so to speak. I'm not sure that I've ever had control over her. Uh, in a book I published under the title Slow Man, uh, this absence of control uh, is signaled by the way in which Elizabeth Costello appears without warning and without invitation in the life of the main character of the book. Uh, in a similar way, she appeared without warning and without invitation in my own life, demanding entry into the world. Um, I'm well aware that this talk about fictional characters who demand entry into the real world is a metaphor. It's a shorthand way of talking about something that is much less mystical but much more complicated. But it seems to me there's nothing wrong in talking in metaphors. Mm. Certainly. Broadly speaking, Elizabeth Costello is skeptical about human reason, rationality, which, in her opinion, has led humankind to the brink of disaster. To our faculty of reason, she opposes our faculty of sympathy, which she th thinks we do, do not cultivate enough. Can you explain what she means by our faculty of sympathy and why it is so important to her? Well, to begin with, Elizabeth Costello herself is not a sympathetic, a simpatica person. Mm. On the contrary, she can be arrogant, she can be overbearing, she can be intolerant. But she does believe that what makes the inner lives of other living beings accessible to us, other beings including human beings, is our faculty of sympathy, which is our capacity to reach out imaginatively and enter other lives and live them from the inside, even if only briefly for a while. And she opposes sympathy to rationality. She believes that the virtues of rationality are overblown. Uh, in particular, she believes that a rational approach to relations with other people and other beings in general is not only limiting but also potentially destructive. Thus, for instance, she believes that a purely rational approach to farming expressed in a science of agricultural economics leads to a world of unimaginable cruelty. In 
In one of the interviews published in your book, Cartas de Navegación, you describe yourself as a person of the left who is nevertheless alienated by political language. You have accordingly chosen in the Seven Moral Tales and elsewhere to address questions of a broadly political nature through the language of fiction. Do you think that political questions and more broadly philosophical questions can be addressed adequately in the medium of fiction? Um, Cartas de Navegación, to which you refer, was put together nearly 20 years ago. Mm. Uh, but I would still endorse the, the passage that you refer to. I'm still in broad sympathy with the concerns of the left, and I'm still bored and alienated by the language of politics. The stories of mine that seem to, ad on the surface, to address political or moral questions do not seem to me to be about politics or morality as such. They seem to me to be about people going through crises of one kind or another, usually moral crises with a political coloring. Um, my position is therefore in broad concord with the position of Elizabeth Costello. Uh, not rational analysis of what, my, what one might call a problem or a question, for instance, the question of how we should respond to industrial farming, but sympathetic exploration of what it is like to undergo a crisis of this kind facing such a problem. Uh, specifically, in several of the uh, uh, stories in uh, uh, Seven Moral Tales, I explore Elizabeth Costello's feeling that her own views on the way in which human beings treat animals her own views are so idiosyncratic, so extreme, that she may be placing herself outside the human community and indeed may be losing her mind. That is, she who has always felt that she is in the right may have been in the wrong all the time. Hmm. Um, I wonder whether this is not a good place for me to read from the Siete Cuentos. Yeah, let's do that. Um, I'd like to, to read the, a, a section from the last story in the collection, a story called uh, The Glass Abattoir. Um, and the section I'll read, in the section I'll read, uh, Elizabeth, Costello, Elizabeth Costello's son, John, who is a man of middle age now, is reading a journal that his mother has kept over the years. Um, so I will read a section, Soledad will read a section in translation, come back to me and so forth and so forth. He picks up his mother's journal and leafs through it. It starts with several pages of prose headed Djibouti 1990. He settles down to read. I am in Djibouti in Northeast Africa, he reads. On a visit to the market, I watch a young man very tall, like most people in this part of the world, naked above the waist, 
bearing in his arms a handsome young goat. The goat, which is pure white, sits peacefully there, gazing around, enjoying the ride. Él toma el diario manuscrito de su madre y se pone a ojearlo. Hay varias páginas de prosa al comienzo que tienen este encabezamiento. Djibouti, 1990. Se sienta a leer. Estoy en Djibouti, África nororiental. Recorro el mercado y observo a un hombre joven, muy alto, como la mayoría de la gente de esta parte del mundo. Tiene el torso desnudo y lleva en los brazos un hermoso cabrito. El animal, totalmente blanco, está acomodado allí plácidamente y mira a su alrededor disfrutando del paseo. Behind the market stalls is an area where the earth and stones are stained dark red, almost black, with blood. Nothing grows there, not a weed, not a blade of grass. It is the slaughter place where goats and sheep and poultry are killed. It is to this slaughter place that the man is bringing his goat. I do not follow them. I know what happens there. I have seen it already and have no wish to see it again. The young man will gesture to one of the slaughter men who will take the goat from him and hold it on the ground, gripping the four legs tightly. The young man will take the knife from the scabbard that saps against his thigh and, without preamble, slit the goat's throat. Then watch while the body convulses and the lifeblood Pumps out. Más allá de los puestos del mercado, hay una zona en que la tierra y las piedras tienen un color rojo oscuro, casi negro. Están embebidas en sangre. No crece nada en ese lugar, ni un yuyo, ni una brisna de hierba. Ahí matan a los cabritos, las ovejas y las aves de corral. Ahí lleva el hombre a su cabrito. No sigo sus pasos. Sé lo que sucede en ese lugar. Ya lo he visto, no quiero verlo de nuevo. El joven del cabrito le hará un gesto a uno de los hombres del matadero que agarrará el cabrito y lo sujetará al suelo manteniendo unidas con fuerza las cuatro patas. Entonces, el joven extraerá un cuchillo de la vaina que cuelga contra su muslo y, sin preámbulos, cortará de un tajo la garganta del cabrito. Después se quedará mirando los estertores y la sangre que brota a borbotones. Cuando el goat is finally still, he will chop off his head slit open his abdomen, pull out his inner organs into the tin basin that the slaughterman will hold, run a wire through his hocks, hang him from the convenient pole, and peel off his skin. Then he will cut him in half lengthwise and bring the two halves plus the head with its open but glazed eyes to the market itself where, on a good day, these physical remains will fetch 900 Djiboutian francs, or five U.S. dollars. Cuando el animal por fin quede inmóvil, le cortará la cabeza, abrirá en canal el abdomen y extraerá las vísceras para depositarlas en el recipiente de lata que sostiene el hombre del matadero. Después... Pasará un alambre por los corvejones, suspenderá el cuerpo de una barra y le quitará el pellejo. Por último, lo partirá a lo largo en dos mitades que llevará al mercado propiamente dicho, junto con la cabeza de ojos abiertos y vidriosos. Si tiene suerte, obtendrá por esos restos 900 francos de Djibouti o 5 
dólares estadounidenses. Conveyed to the home of its buyer, the body will be cut into small pieces and roasted over coals, while the head will be boiled in a cauldron. What is not found to be edible, principally the bones, will be thrown to the dogs. And that will be the end of the goat as he was in the pride of his days, no trace will remain. It will be as if he had never existed. No one will remember him save myself, a stranger who happened to see him and happened to be seen by him on his way to his death. Una vez en casa del comprador, el cuerpo será trozado y asado sobre las brasas, pero la cabeza servirá en un caldero. Lo que no sea comestible se arrojará a los perros, especialmente los huesos, y ese será el fin. Del cabrito, tal como era en la flor de la vida, no quedará ningún rastro, como si jamás hubiera existido. Nadie lo recordará, salvo yo una extranjera que lo vio por casualidad, a quien él vio por casualidad cuando iba camino a la muerte. That stranger who has not forgotten him now turns to his shade and asks two questions. First, what were you thinking as you rode to market that morning in your master's arms? Did you really not know where he was taking you? Could you not smell the blood? Why did you not struggle to escape? And the second question is, what do you think was going on in that young man's mind as he carried you to market? You, whom he had known since the day you were born, who were one of the flock he led out to forage every morning and brought home, every evening. Did he breathe any word of apology for what he was about to do to you? Esa extranjera, que no lo ha olvidado, se dirige ahora a la sombra del cabrito y le hace dos preguntas. La primera, ¿qué pensaba mientras ibas esa mañana al mercado en brazos de tu dueño? ¿Realmente no sabías a dónde te llevaba? ¿No alcanzabas a oler la sangre? ¿Por qué no luchaste por escapar? La segunda pregunta es esta. ¿Qué crees que se cruzaba por la cabeza de ese joven que te llevaba al mercado? ¿A ti, a quien conocía desde el día en que naciste, que eras parte del rebaño que llevaba a pastar todas las mañanas y traía de regreso todas las tardes? ¿Susurró alguna palabra de disculpa por lo que se proponía hacer? Why do I ask these questions? Because I want to understand what you and your brothers and sisters think of the deal that your forefathers struck with humankind many generations ago. In terms of that deal, humankind undertook to protect you against your natural enemies, the lion and the jackal. In return, Your forefathers undertook that when the time came, they would yield up their bodies to their protectors to be devoured. Furthermore, that their progeny unto the hundredth and the thousandth generation would do the same. It strikes me as a bad deal, weighted too heavily against your tribe. If I were a goat, I would prefer to take my chance with the lions and the jackals. But I am not a goat and do not know how a goat's mind works. Perhaps it is the way of the goat to think. The fate that befell my parents, grandparents, may not befall me. Perhaps the way of the goat is to live in hope. ¿Y por qué te hago estas preguntas? Porque intento comprender lo que piensan ustedes, tú y tus hermanos y hermanas, 
del trato que hicieron tus antepasados con la humanidad hace muchas generaciones. Según ese pacto, los seres humanos se comprometieron a protegeros contra vuestros enemigos naturales, el león y el chacal. Por su parte, tus antepasados se comprometieron a retribuir esa protección, llegado el momento, cediendo a esos protectores su cuerpo para que lo devoraran. Más aún, se comprometieron a que sus descendientes, hasta la centésima y la milésima generación, hicieran lo mismo. Opino que es un maltrato muy desfavorable para tu tribu. Si yo fuera cabra, preferiría arriesgarme a los leones y los chacales. Pero no soy cabra y no sé cómo funciona la mente de una cabra. Tal vez las cabras piensen, puede ser que no corra la misma suerte que mis padres y mis abuelos. Quizá el temperamento de las cabras las lleve a vivir con esperanza. So, um, few more questions. In several of your stories about Elizabeth Costello, Elizabeth's two children, now middle-aged, try to persuade her to accept that she is growing old, that she may soon be in need of care, and therefore that she should move into some kind of facility for the aged. Elizabeth resists all their efforts. Where should our sympathies lie as readers of these stories? With the parent or with the children? Yes. Um, as you say, Elizabeth's son and daughter, one living in the United States, one living in France, grow worried about her. Who will take care of her if she falls ill? What will happen if she slips and breaks a limb? They try to persuade her to leave her home uh, and move to one of those places that is known euphemistically in English as an aged care facility. Uh, and she resists all their efforts. Um, several of the uh, Siete Cuentos grow out of this struggle between the mother and her children, uh, a struggle which is becoming more and more common in the modern world, where families are small and it is no longer customary for a parent to come and live with one of her children when she grows old. Uh, in real life, I think our sympathies are, more often than not, with the parent, for we know that life in one of these facilities will almost certainly be miserable. But perhaps as a person who may soon be in need of an aged care facility himself, my testimony cannot be trusted. Perhaps the children are right. <laughs> in your story, The Old Woman and the Cats, Elizabeth Costello says, a cat has a soul, but not a character. Could you explain? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll be brief. People who are fond of cats or dogs commonly claim that each animal has a unique character. This, it seems to me, is not true. Uh, animals undoubtedly have individual traits, and if the animal is treated as a pet, it is usually encouraged to express its individual traits. But a set of a few easily recognized traits does not add up to a character in the sense that each human being has an individual character. Uh, more controversial is Eliz Elizabeth's claim that an animal has a soul, a soul but not a character. Um, here she is expressing a view, a position that is common in Catholic theology, that animals have souls, 
though not immortal souls. Um, and to this Catholic position, one may contrast the Cartesian position after René Descartes, that animals are machines, machines made of, not of metal, but of flesh and blood. In the same story, Elizabeth Costello reveals that she is disliked by the people of the village in Spain, where she has taken up residence because she has been taking feral cats into her home and thus promoting a population explosion among the villagers' cats. Do the villagers not have a point? <coughs> and um, might a similar point not be made about the vegetarianism which Elizabeth advocates? If human beings stopped killing and eating cattle, sheep, and poultry, pigs, what would become of all these creatures spared from the butcher's knife? Who would feed them and take care of them? Well, the villagers do indeed have a point. By providing a home for the wild cats and <coughs> allowing them to breed in an uncontrolled way, Elizabeth is upsetting an ecological balance. And Elizabeth understands this very well herself. Nevertheless, she persists in acting in a way that is, ecologically speaking, reckless. Um, and to justify her actions, she uses imagery of unborn souls waiting at the gate for a chance to enter the world and experience life than which there is no higher good. Who are we, says Elizabeth, to dictate who will be allowed to live and who will not? And let me mention in parenthesis that this is exactly the argument made by opponents of abortion. A similar accusation of recklessness can be made against the vegetarianism that Elizabeth advocates. What indeed is going to happen to all the billions of cattle in the world to take up just the case of cattle if we suddenly stopped killing them for food? Do we really expect the world's farmers to go on feeding them and caring for them and their progeny indefinitely into the future. Cattle are domesticated animals. They are incapable of taking care of themselves. They will simply die of starvation. Is dying of starvation a better fate than having your throat cut? As I said earlier, my interest is not so much in the abstract question of whether we should kill and eat animals, as in the situation of an intelligent person, in this case, Elizabeth Costello, who is wrestling in a moral and an intellectual sense with the question. In the book, El Buen Relato, that you co-authored with Arabella Kurz, the psychoanalyst, analyst, psychotherapist from Britain, there's a whole chapter about group experience, music, football, ecstatic religion, as well as a theoretical discussion of group thought. Does your interest in how groups think have to do with the fact that you grew up in apartheid South Africa? Um, the answer is yes. Uh, the psychology of groups is something that interests me very much, even though psychoanalysis do does not have much to say about it. There have been attempts to analyze 
what happens to groups uh, psychologically when they become mobs. Uh, perfectly normal, civilized human beings can, under certain circumstances, come together in a crowd and regress toward quite primitive behavior. Uh, one has only to think of some crowds at football matches. Um, but you, you ask specifically whether my interest in the psychology of groups has to do with my upbringing in South Africa in the 1940s and 1950s. Uh, let me just be autobiographical for a moment. Uh, I was a child with a somewhat infirm social identity, growing up in times of intense nationalistic passion and uh, intense intergroup hostility. So my interest in groups, in group thinking, in group behavior, dates back to the time I was seven or eight years old. Uh, in particular, I have been trying to understand what it is that makes people hate without adequate motive. Do we choose the people we hate and then hate them in a similar way to the way we choose the people we love and then love them? I'll stop there, I think. Is the discipline of psychoanalysis of any importance to you as a writer? Is the discipline of psychoanalysis important to me as a writer? Uh, I would say it's more important to me as someone who thinks about what the nature of truth might be uh, someone who thinks about us as moral beings. Um, you ask whether the discipline of psychoanalysis is important to me. I, sh I should mention to the audience that you are the publisher of uh, a work on uh, psychoanalysis, the work that you mentioned earlier, that I co-wrote with Arabella, Kur Arabella Kurtz, and that you are responsible for bringing to a Spanish, uh, Spanish language audience uh, a, this book, uh, the, good s the Good Story, Exchanges on Truth, Fiction, and Psychotherapy. So uh, you know the answer. Psychoanalysis does indeed mean a great deal to me. Um, the book commences by asking, what does psychotherapy of a psychoanalytic kind hope to achieve. Um, Sigmund Freud is claimed to have said that if a therapist can send a patient back into the world enabled to work and to love, that would be the sign of a successful therapy be able to work and to love. And the question that troubled me and my co-author Arabella Kurtz was this. If the goal of the therapist is this practical goal of enabling the patient to function in the world, is it actually necessary that the therapist bring the patient to confront the truth about himself? Is it not enough for the therapist to send the patient out into the world with an empowering fiction about himself? Why should the patient and the therapist not collaborate to produce a life story for the patient, a life story that may or may not be true, but that will help the patient to function? So that was one, it seems to me, central uh, psychoanalytic uh, question that we addressed. A second was the question of repression. And the question we asked was whether it is true 
that the repressed has always to re-emerge, the famous return of the repressed, or whether people can successfully repress aspects of their past that they find unpleasant to face. Are there not cases where people quite happily forget their past and reinvent themselves? And the crucial cases I had in mind in asking this question were people who had been, vo been involved in acts of cruelty, people like torturers, prison guards, etc. People who had committed terrible acts and then retired, moved to the suburbs, and seemed to be living perfectly ordinary lives. Now, the, the orthodox theory of repression would say that some part of the evil they had committed must re-emerge to make their lives unhappy. And the question we asked is whether it is not possible for a torturer to retire and live a happy life and die a peaceful death. A, th a third and last topic of a psychoanalytic nature that I will mention before leaving the subject is historical in nature. Uh, I have had homes in South Africa and Australia and lived for many years in the United States. All these countries have a history behind them of subjugating and expropriating native peoples. Question, how should the present generation feel about their ancestors, the ancestors who did this subjugating and expropriating? Here we touch on the question of guilt and again on the question of repression. Let me frame the question in the simplest way. Our grandparents and great-grandparents were, in terms of today's thinking, criminals. They indulged in theft and, in some cases, in violence and murder. But these grandparents or great-grandparents of ours did not think of themselves as criminals. On the contrary, they thought of themselves as involved in an enlightened mission. They were claiming the new land for civilization. They were bringing the gospel to the heathen. So, the present generation feels or ought to feel great ambivalence toward its ancestors. These ancestors were on the one hand criminals, but on the other hand, they thought of themselves as good people, just as we today think of ourselves as good people. Now, at a psychological level, how is this ambivalence toward the past to be handled? And in the book, we suggest that we handle it by telling ourselves the following story. Number one, our forefathers did bad things, but they are not to be blamed because they were in the grip of false, unenlightened beliefs. Number two, we tell ourselves, because of universal progress, we have more modern and enlightened beliefs than our forefathers. And then we tell ourselves number three, if in the future, as history unfolds, we are revealed to be as deeply mistaken and unenlightened as our forefathers were, there is nothing we can do about it because it is in the nature of history that there is just one story after another, each one supplanting the one before. Therefore, the best thing to do is to forget or repress the whole matter and get on with our lives. Now, to get back to your question, here we have the example of a group, perhaps an entire society, practicing repression. 
And the question I ask is, when a society feels that it has no duty to feel troubled by the past, when, in effect, a society refuses to enter therapy, can a healing process ever begin? The Austrian novelist Robert Musil seems to be important to you. You have written several essays about him and you have included him among the authors of your personal library. In one of the seven moral tales, you allude to his story, The Perfection of a Marriage. Could you expand on the importance of him to you? Yes. Uh, well, Robert Mosell had the same kind of intellectual formation that I have, that I had. He in engineering, I in mathematics. Uh, his studies led Mosell to think deeply about the foundations of knowledge. And in his fiction, he tried to find a way to give a voice to his thinking. Uh, and let me very, very briefly offer an outline of Mosel's thinking. And you'll, I think, then at once be able to answer for yourself the question of to what extent I have followed in Mosel's footsteps. To be able to function in the world of the rational, says Mosel, we have to ignore the irrational that lies mysteriously under our feet. We must accept the conventions of our society regarding what is to be admitted as real and what is to be ignored. We must, in effect, elect a kind of blindness. Yet, says Mosil, it is still possible to keep one's eyes open while one lives and functions in the real world if one maintains a certain attitude of reserve toward the real. One can live what Mosil called the in the subjunctive mood. One can live a hovering life, a life without ideological commitment. One can be a being without qualities. One can operate in the mode of irony. And uh, I like to think of a statement of Mosil's, with me, irony is a form of struggle. To enter <coughs> this other condition, Mosil believed, one must give up the model of scientific thinking and take up the model of poetic creation. That is to say, one must abandon logical thinking in favor of analogical thinking. As Mosil developed as a writer, his fiction became increasingly essayistic in structure with only perfunctory gestures in the direction of realistic narrative. And I notice that the same thing is happening to me. Witness the Siete Cuentos. Hmm. And the last question, we will close with this last question. Praying is a way of talking with the unknown. Does writing have any similarity to praying? Does writing have a similarity to praying is an interesting idea. Uh, prayer is a puzzling form of discourse mm. which appears in every human society that I know of. And it's puzzling because it is by definition addressed to a you who is not present in any observable way. Um, yet, 
as far as I'm aware, theorists of discourse have little or nothing to say on the subject of prayer. Is writing like prayer? There are ways in which I think the two are indeed alike. In both cases, it's hard to specify to whom one's discourse is addressed. It is quite possible that it is addressed to no one. Also, both prayer and writing are disciplines. In writing, you have to subject yourself to the blankness of the page and wait patiently to hear whether the blankness answers you. Sometimes the blankness does not answer you and then you know despair. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>